our first speaker, uh, uh, we are really, really fortunate to have Dr. Stu Weinstein uh, with us today. Uh, Dr. Weinstein is uh, at the uh, University of Iowa, and he has been in practice. He, he told me he's entering his 40th year in practice uh, this year. Uh, he is one of the best known orthopedic surgeons in the entire country, not just in pediatric orthopedics. He's been president of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. He's been president of the American Board of Orthopedic Surgeons. He's been president of the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America. Um, he is really one of the most recognized people. And his study uh, a few years ago, the study that he led on um, an NIH-funded study on bracing really completely changed the way we look at this non-operative treatment. Um, and we're just really lucky to have him willing to fly into Philadelphia for just the morning to talk to you about bracing and then answer your questions. So, Wednesday. Well, thanks so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. And my purpose this morning is to talk to you a little bit about the history of bracing why we did the study we did, what the results were just briefly, and what we're doing in the future because we're still not, don't have all of the answers yet. So you know that bracing began in the 1940s and the first brace, the Milwaukee brace, was a brace that was actually developed to use after surgery. In those days there were no rods or any implants, so patients who needed surgery had a fusion in situ and they were put in a cast to hold the correction. And then they went into the Milwaukee brace afterwards. And somehow, it then evolved to be used as a treatment to hopefully prevent the need for surgery. But there was never any evidence to support that it works or it doesn't work. So in my own institution, we began looking back at our Milwaukee brace patients. And what we found is that we had a high rate of failure. But at that time, we were bracing everybody. So if you look at all these children, they're well over 40 degrees. They wouldn't fit in our indications to bracing today, but no one really knew what the indications were. So we had a reasonable amount of failure. And also we found that the Milwaukee brace, which was a brace, you may see some examples out in the hall, which had a, a neck ring that came around your neck, was pretty difficult for kids to wear, and there were a lot of psychosocial effects. So in the mid-'80s, bracing changed to more modern braces, underarm braces, and we looked at our braces there, and we still found that we had a fair number of failures. But again, the indications for bracing were less clear than they are today. So we decided, well, is this just us? Are we not doing a good job? Or how's everyone else doing? So we did what's called a systematic review. And we reviewed the world literature on bracing and also the world literature on patients who not, were not treated. They were observed. And we couldn't find any conclusive evidence that braces made a difference. And about the same time, the United States Preventive Task Force on Screening came out with a recommendation saying you shouldn't screen for scoliosis. And this was kind of a bad thing, but they looked at the evidence just like we did independently, and they couldn't find evidence that braces worked. So therefore, if you're going to screen for something and there's, treatment, there's no treatment for it, there's no point in screening. So they recommended against school screening. So this led to a lot of confusion. And people in the world that most of the doctors here live in were kind of conflicted. Some were very convinced that braces do prevent the need for surgery. Other feeling, let's not brace. Let's just wait and see how each child does. And if they come to surgery, you know, that's their natural history. Um, so it was my feeling that, you know, bracing was never really looked at um, to say whether it was efficacious or it was effective. So our own results of our own reviews, looking at the world literature, the U.S. Preventative Task Force saying no school screening because they don't think there's any effective treatment gave us a lot of fuel for the fire to do a prospective study. So we applied to the National Institute of Health for funds to do a study. And our study was sponsored by the NIH primarily. The Canadian Institute of Health Research, which is the Canadian equivalent of the NIH, the Shriners Hospitals were very supportive, and two independent hospitals. And we did a study basically to say, do braces work? Do they prevent the need for surgery? In other words, the curve getting to what most people would say is the standard indication for surgery, which is 50 degrees. And our goal was to have a trial that we would offer, randomized trial, that when a child was eligible, 
the child and their parents would say, we're willing to be randomized to treatment versus observation. And our secondary goal is to see, well, does it matter how much you wear the brace? Is that important or not? And so we had 25 institutions in the United States and Canada, and we began enrolling patients in 2007. And I'll just tell you that we had to do lots of studies before we could get all this federal money. And one of the studies we did was how many parent-child combinations would be willing to randomize. So if you're offered a trial, you know, you can't just enter your child into a, a trial. They have to agree to it as well. And so we, we estimated that 25% of all parent-child uh, families would agree to be randomized. Well, it turned out after we started the study, we were two years into it, that only 19% of people would be randomized. Most people had a preference. They either wanted treatment or no treatment. And so we had to get some change in the rules. So the, the trial then evolved to, if you didn't want to be randomized, you could then choose, I want to brace or I want to be observed. But all the parameters are the same. And we eventually completed the enrollment in 2011. And this is the standard. A youngster who would be a candidate for bracing. That's a child 10 to 15 years of age or curved 20 to 40 degrees and someone who's skeletally immature. And we universally define skeletal immaturity as having your periods for a girl less than a year and having a risser stage, the, the bones that your doctors look at on your hips less than two. That's kind of the universal agreement of immaturity. And so these are the patients who were entered in the trial. Well, the trial was going, but the NIH stopped it in 2013 because I, as the principal investigator, never knew what the results were because I'm blinded because that's how a, a randomized trial goes. But the people who actually look at the data and could see it showed that inconclusive, it was conclusive evidence that braces do work. And therefore, they had to stop the trial because it's unethical now not to brace someone because braces do work. So this study has what we call level one evidence, very strong. That's the highest evidence. That's the children who are randomized, treatment, no treatment, that braces do work to prevent the need for surgery or the curve getting to uh, an area of 50 degrees. There's also, if you take everybody, even the non-randomized patients, there's still extremely strong evidence that braces work. And the other important factor is it matters how much you wear your brace because if you wear your brace six hours a day, you might as well not wear it at all because that's the same as, as kids who uh, just didn't have a brace. But if you wore it at least 13 hours a day, you had a 90% chance of not needing surgery, of your curve not getting to 50 degrees. And this is just aggregate. So every child may need a little more. Some children may need to wear it more. But this is just the aggregate numbers that 13 hours a day was the time that gave you a 90% chance of not reaching 50 degrees. And if you're interested, this study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013. So what I would leave you with on this aspect of what I'm talking about is that there is strong, the highest level of evidence in medicine that braces do work to prevent the curve from getting to a 50 degree threshold, which is what most people would say is the surgical threshold. So this article got a lot of press in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, the Huffington Post, everywhere. But I, what I wanted to leave you with is just a few more slides to say the story is not over. Because what we're trying to do with this data now is define who is actually the best person to, to receive a brace because we're still actually bracing too many kids because there are certain factors we don't know about scoliosis. So we're looking to take the data we've gathered to help you as families and future families decide how do we avoid over-treatment. And my colleague, Lori Dolan, who couldn't be here today, is working with me. And we're working on models to try and give you some kind of handle on how to make decisions in this difficult decisions that you as parents and children have to make about, uh, you know, will I benefit from bracing? What's my chances of success, et cetera? So let me just go through quickly some of these mathematical models, and we'll use um, a 30-degree curve as the example. And you have in your handout many more detailed slides. I'm just going to move ahead here. So if you take all patients who didn't have treatment, who were in the observation group, Still, 42% of them came out okay. They didn't wind up having surgery for genetic reasons, for very, or they reached maturity very quickly. 
but I want to show you here, if your risks are zero, in other words, very immature, your chance of a good outcome is only 36%. But if you're more mature, risks are one or two, you still have an 80% chance of a good outcome. If you look at your Cobb angle, if you have a small Cobb angle of 20 degrees, your chance of success is quite good. But as you get to larger curves, here's the 30 degree curve, it's 50-50. Now this is untreated. It's 50-50 whether you'll come out okay or not. And a higher magnitude curve, it's only 20% that you'll have a good outcome without treatment. Now this is a 30 degree curve. So as I told you a moment ago, without treatment, if you have a 30 degree curve, you have a 50% chance of doing okay. You may do okay and you may not do okay. If you have a 30 degree curve and you're immature, your risks are zero, very immature, you only have a 28% chance of not needing surgery, so it's quite low. And if you then add a brace, if you have those same parameters and you wear a brace, you have a 75% uh, chance of a good outcome. So that's pretty significant. To me, that's pretty compelling if I'm someone who has scoliosis or if my child has scoliosis. So the last thing I'll leave you with is also if you have that same curve and you you are diligent about wearing your brace, you just see as your time in the brace increases, your success also increases. So I hope for, for those of you who are actually in treatment now or thinking about it, it's compelling reason to say once you, you get a uh, brace, you really do need to wear it. You need to buy into it. There's lots of factors in success, and some of it are things we can't control. That's your genetics. But the other things that are important are are your orth orthotist, the, the correction you get in the brace, and how good you are about wearing the brace. And I hope what I've given you is some uh, inspiration to say, hey, this is really positive. It can save, hopefully prevent you from needing surgery, not always. But uh, again, you need a good relationship with your physician, your orthotist, and you need to have the, the personal perseverance to really you know, stick to it and really something that's quite difficult to do. So thanks so much for your attention.